This is lesson 12, beetles, flies, and true bugs. Throughout the summer, beetles are so plentiful that we don't, we usually don't stop to appreciate what amazing and beautiful creations they are. There's a good reason there are so many beetles around us all summer long. There are more species of beetle on earth than any other type of insect. Scientists have identified more than 300,000 species of beetle, and there are many others that have not been identified. Wow. Depending on where you live, you might have June beetles. We don't have that here in Alaska, but other places do. Continually hitting against your porch light, Japanese beetles feeding on plants in your garden, or bark beetles destroying the trees in your yard. Yay. As with most insects, beetles have two pairs of wings. However, you might not consider the front pair wings, since they are not used in flight. These front wings, called elytra, usually cover the entire body of the beetle. This hard covering protects the beetle very well making it like a little nut, hard to crack or hurt. In fact, beetles are put in order Coleoptera, which means sheath wings, referring to the elytra. Under these protective sheath wings, you find the membranous wings, the back wings, that the beetle uses in flight. If you know what you are looking for, it is usually easy to tell whether or not an insect is a beetle. Beetles have hard exoskeletons. And the front wings meet to form a single line down the center of the back. From that description, you can look at the insects below and see if you can tell which ones are beetles. You can check whether or not, well, really can't check in the back of the book because I have the book. However, you can't always can't always check. You guys are smart enough to figure it out. Beetle behavior. There are so many beetles. Because there are so many beetles, there are many that have never been seen or studied. Some sources say that if you walk through rainforest for an entire day, sweeping the ground with a net as you walk, you will pick up at least one beetle that has never been seen or studied before. That'd be pretty cool. Maybe you'll get an opportunity to do that, but you would need lots and lots of mosquito repellent. Otherwise you'd be eaten alive. Beetles are fabulous little creatures and because they are so numerous on the earth, you shouldn't have a difficult time finding one to study once, you know, it actually warms up around here, like in uh, late spring and summer, which we still have a while to wait for that. Many beetles are nocturnal, which means they are mostly active at night. They tend to spend the day sleeping, typically underneath rocks or logs or even in the dirt. At the end of this lesson, you will, well, hopefully when the spring comes, you'll have a, can see if you can find some beetles. And you can look at them and experiment with them. It'll be fun. Beetles have bite, biting, chewing mouths. And some can look quite fearsome. However, very few beetles actually bite people. And the ones that do typically only bite if they are handled. Although the majority of beetles won't hurt you, some have been given amazing weapons for defense. You have already learned about how the bomb deer beetle can squirt boiling hot gases and how the blister beetle can release oil that causes blisters. Some can even suction themselves to a plant so birds can't pick them up to eat them. Despite examples like these, most beetles are safe to handle and study. All beetles go through complete metamorphosis. Once a beetle egg hatches, the young beetle may start out a larva only a few, we only a few weeks or it may stay a larva up to 12 years, depending on the kind of grubs. Yet unlike bees and ant grubs, they are equipped with little beetle faces, contain chewing mouth parts with which to eat plants or animals. 
After the pupa stage, they become adult beetles that can fly. Adults usually live until they have mated or laid eggs, which can be a few weeks or many years. Both beneficial and pesky. A few beetles are truly beneficial and include some of our favorite flying creatures, like ladybugs and fireflies. Yes, it's true. A ladybug is not a bug, and a firefly is not a fly. They are both beetles. Lady beetles, as they should be called, are so helpful to farmers that they can be ordered and sent to farmers all over North America. These little creatures eat terrible pests that destroy both important food crops and decorative flower garden flowers. At the same time, many beetles are major pests and are responsible for destroying crops that we need for food. Both the larvae and the adults take part in this destruction. Colorado potato beetle, for example, can decimate a potato crop. Both the larvae and the adults feed on the leaves of potato plants, and without enough leaves, the plants cannot survive. A few species of beetle have come to America as a result of trade between countries and have spread rapidly. Japanese beetles, for example, accidentally came to the United States from Japan, probably as eggs in a plant. They eat up crops and garden plants all over the eastern United States. Even though some beetles destroy crops and forests, they can be very beautiful and interesting to study. So I want to look at just a few of them, a few of the many families of beetles. Of course, what I will talk about here only scratches the surface of the world of beetles. An etymologist can spend his whole life studying one single family or even one single beetle in a family and still not learn all there is to know about it. Scarab beetles. Scarab beetles belong to family Scarabidae, Scarabi and they're easy to identify if you can look at their antennae. Scarab beetle antennae end in little clubs that open and close. When open, they look like tiny fans, and when they close, they look like knobs at the end of the antennae. Aside from this common feature, scarab beetles can look very different from one another especially in their faces and heads. Some scarab beetles have long, pinching mandibles, and some even have a big horn. June beetles, June bugs, tumble bugs, Japanese beetles, rhinoceros beetles, stag beetles, Hercules beetles, dung beetles, elephant beetles, and goliath beetles are all in this family. The beetle in this family are usually medium to large and sometimes very brightly colored. One of the largest beetles on the earth is in this family. Can you guess what it is? We just went over it. If you guessed Goliath beetle, you are correct. The Goliath beetle is named after the giant in the Bible, 1 Samuel 7, 14, because it is so large. It can grow longer than six inches, which is really big for a beetle. Not surprisingly, an elephant, elephant beetles are very large as well. So what's for dinner if you are a scarab beetle? Probably some flowers, fruits, or leaves. But if you are a dung beetle, you prefer animal droppings, also called dung. Sounds pretty disgusting, doesn't it? Well, even though it is disgusting, it's actually very helpful to people and animals because it cleans up the environment so there are garbage men for the earth. Both dung beetle larvae and adults love to feast on dung. Isn't that lovely? And the way a dung beetle makes sure its larvae are fed is nothing short of remarkable. God designed this little creature to use its legs and mouth to shape some dung into round, sometimes pear-shaped balls. After the dung is shaped, the beetle rolls and rolls and rolls the dung on the ground, this way and that way, until it reaches home. The ball of dung can be up to 50 times heavier than the beetle rolling it. Once the beetle gets the ball home, 
which is a hole in the ground, the female will leg an egg into it. When there are several balls of dung, each will, with an egg in it, the female will cover the hole with soil and more dung. When the eggs hatch, the larvae can eat to their heart's content. Yummy. As time goes on, they eventually reach the pupa stage and then transform into adults. Most dung beetles live for three to five years. Scientists believe that without the dung beetle, we would have piles of dung everywhere. Ew. There are thousands of species of dung beetles. And wherever they are found, wherever dung can be found. Which is just about everywhere. Dung beetles are considered very beneficial. And are even shipped places where too much dung begins to be a problem. I'm sure glad God made the dung beetle. Aren't you? Now we're going to look at fireflies and lightning bugs. Well, they're the same thing. Just different name. For who knows how long, children have loved to chase and collect fireflies, which are also called lightning bugs. They have collected fireflies in jars, and companies have even sold necklaces that consist of a string attached to a little plastic container into which you are supposed to put a firefly. All these activities amount to loads of fun. Of course, it's probably not fun for the firefly, but it is definitely fun for kids. If you grow up to be an etymologist, you will still get to play with fireflies. Not only that, you will get paid to do it. Doesn't that sound fun? Were you surprised to learn that fireflies are not flies? Even though some people call them lightning bugs, they aren't bugs either. They are beetles, very special beetles. They can create their own light. That's pretty special. They aren't pests either. They usually eat other insects nectar or pollen. One kind actually eats other fireflies. The larvae, which walk around on the ground and look nothing like the adults, eat mostly worms, snails, and slugs. So fireflies are quite beneficial to us since snails and slugs eat crops and garden plants. The larvae actually eat their prey in an interesting way. They bite their prey and inject digestive juices into them. The digestive juices turn the prey into liquid, which the larvae then drink. The larva stage, that sounds just like a spider, but it's disturbing. But anyways, that's how they eat. The larva stage lasts quite a while, as the fireflies won't actually become adults until the following spring. The larvae continue to gobble up food until the fall, when they burrow under the ground and hibernate through the winter. In the spring, they emerge from the ground eat a little bit more, and then enter the pupa stage, which usually lasts for two weeks. At the end of the pupa stage, the firefly is an adult, which is what gets caught and put into jars. Some species will actually hibernate for several years. If those are the kinds of fireflies that live in your area, you'll probably see it some, some adults, more adults in some years than you do in other years. Even though most adult fireflies eat small insects, pollen or nectar some actually eat nothing at all they may lay eggs and die all within a few days fireflies are bioluminescent that means they make their own light they do this by producing certain chemicals and mixing them together the reaction between those chemicals produces a light but virtually no heat as a result it's often called cold light this is amazing because that's not the way it is for the light bulbs that we use to make light about 90% of the energy used by non-fluorescent light bulb is converted into heat, while only about 10% of the energy makes light. Even in fluorescent lights, which are more efficient, only about 15-20% to 20 of the energy is used to make light. Either way, that's a lot of wasted energy, which means it's a lot of wasted money. After all, we pay for all the energy that comes into our homes. The firefly doesn't waste energy like we do. Since it makes cold light, more than 90% of the energy it uses in bioluminescence ends up making light. Only about 4% is lost to heat. If we could light our homes as efficiently as fireflies light their abdomens, we would save a lot of money. Of course, it should be no surprise that the firefly is more efficient at making light than we are. After all, 
The firefly was designed by God. He makes wonderfully efficient, beautiful things. I expect you have watched fireflies at night. If you have, you know they don't leave their lights on all the time. Instead, they flash them on and off. There are three reasons a firefly flashes its light. The main reason it flashes is to attract a mate. The male will flash first. If a female fancies what she sees, she will wait for a specific amount of time and flash her light in response. Every species of firefly has a different pattern and time frame for this flashing. The fireflies of each species know exactly what their pattern and time frame should be. So after the female flashes, if it's the right pattern and time, the male will fly over to her and mate with her. However, there is one kind of female that doesn't play fair. She pretends to be another species in order to lure the male of that species over. When he arrives, she eats him. And that's not nice. That's just cruel. Another reason the firefly flashes is to warn other fireflies of danger. If a firefly gets caught in a spider web, for example, it will flash a warning to others to steer clear of the area. Finally, a firefly might flash its own light to warn predators that's not a tasty meal. Many predators do not like the taste of fireflies, so they learn to avoid insects that emit flashes of light. But not all predators find fireflies distasteful, however, so flashing doesn't always help the firefly warn off predators. Next, we're going to look at ladybugs. I've already mentioned the benefit of ladybugs, but I want to discuss them a little bit more in depth here. Ladybugs are also called ladybirds, but they are not bugs or birds. They are not all ladies. After all, in order to produce eggs that will hatch into larvae, they must mate. That requires a male and a female. The very fact that there are ladybugs around then tells us that there are males as well as females. As I mentioned before, later ladybugs are more properly called lady beetles. Both larvae and adult lady beetles eat aphids and similar insects. Aphids are a huge problem for farmers and gardeners. Do you remember which in insect keeps aphids as pets? Ants herd them like sheep, and ants will also attack a lady beetle that tries to eat one of their aphids. Lady beetle larvae are different from many other beetle larvae. Many beetles have legless grubs that spend the larvae stage under the ground. Lady beetle larvae look like strange adult insects. Lady beetle larvae uh, crawling on plants and consuming aphids all the live long day. You might be frightened at this tiny insect if you were to see one in real life, not knowing it's a sweet baby lady beetle lady beetle. Like all beetles, the lady beetle goes through complete metamorphosis, which means it has a pupa stage as well. Lady beetle pupa, pupae are little reddish and black bumps found on plants. Lady beetles can be red, orange, or yellow with black spots. They can also be black with red spots. Some are missing the spots altogether. There are even a few kinds of lady beetles with metallic blue iridescence and some have checkerboard markings or stripes. Which kind do you have? I don't know what you have here in Toke. Most people think the entire black bulge at the top of the lady beetle is its head. If you look closely, however, the head is the very tiny segment at the top, at the tip of the lady beetle. Most of the black part of the lady beetle is the thorax. It is all black. It sometimes has spot in it, and sometimes it's all black. Can you tell the difference between the head and the thorax in the photo on the right? It only takes about four weeks for the lady beetle to go from an egg to an adult. Compare that to the firefly I told you about earlier. Some females can lay up to a thousand eggs in one summer. Oh, just for reference, the firefly takes uh, nearly a year, sometimes longer. Of course, the lady bee will try to lay her eggs near an aphid colony so the larvae will have a ready supply of food when they hatch. Some lady beetles can live as many as three years, hibernating during the winter. In the autumn, they find a nice crack or crevice, usually in a sunny spot, and snuggle down for a long winter's nap. Some states, like Kentucky, have problems with lady beetles, choosing living rooms as their preferred place of hibernation. Suddenly, the wonderful lady beetles transformed into a pest as people tried to move thousands from their curtains. 
Lady Beetles had the special honor of being astronauts for NASA, America's space program. Yes, four little Lady Beetles were sent into space along with a host of aphids. Because aphids usually escape Lady Beetles by falling from the plant onto the ground, scientists were very curious how the aphid would escape without the help of gravity, which pulls the aphid to the ground when they let go of the plant. It turns out that the aphids could not escape without the help of gravity. So the NASA ladybugs were quite well fed. Next, we're going to look at flies. It's time to discuss some of our least favorite animals. Flies, gnats, and mosquitoes. Scientists usually lump all of these creatures into one order. Dioptera, which means two wings. Oh, sorry, diptera, not dioptera, diptera. Most insects have four wings, but members of this order have only, only two true wings. In addition to these wings, however, they have two little paddles called haltiers that look like tiny wings. Rather than working like wings, however, halt, haltiers work to keep the insect's body balanced while it's flying. Let's start our discussion of this order by looking at flies. Though many flies are considered pests, not all of them are. In fact, most flies are an important part of our world, benefiting us in many ways. Why, without them, our lives wouldn't be nearly as pleasant. One kind of fly, a midge in South America, is the size of the head of a pin, but there's a good chance that it makes your life more enjoyable. How can that be, you ask? Well, this tiny midge is the main pollinator of the cacao plant. Do you know what that means? Without this fly, you would not have any chocolate to eat. So, those of you that love chocolate, I guess you like flies a little bit after all. Some flies are beneficial because they feed on other pests. Marsh, lar marsh fly larvae, for example, feed on snails and slugs. Do you remember the beetle larvae that do this as well? Firefly larvae. Flies and gnats also help us by eating dead animal flesh and feces. This helps the world of dead animals and animal droppings. However, we have to be careful about these same creatures because they can spread the germs they get from these dead animals and feces to our food. Although they're an important part of our world, flies are pests. They are, um, they are also rather dirty creatures to have around. The common housefly has been discovered to carry more than a million different kinds of bacteria in its mouth and on the pads of its feet. It gets these bacteria from the places it feeds. One fly can leave more bacteria on a piece of bread by landing on it than hundreds of cockroaches can by dropping over it. That's, that's really disturbing. Mm. Interestingly, this little bacteria carrier spends a lot of time cleaning itself, much like a cat. The reason it leaves its bacteria in our food is because of the way it eats. As you already learned, a fly eats by vomiting up the contents of its stomach on the food. These can digest the food so it becomes a liquid, and the fly sponges the liquid up. The food stomach contents also contain a lot of nasty bacteria, which can stay behind infecting the food. Fly larvae are called maggots. Most maggots eat all kinds of unpleasant and disgusting things. Feces, dead animals, rotting food, and other rotting things. The larvae of the fruit fly, a tiny fly that looks like a flying speck of dirt, feed on decaying fruit. Fruit flies are so prevalent that if you leave a banana outside in a jar for a few days, you will probably have a brood of fruit flies in no time. Though many maggots feed on plant life, some are actually parasitic, which means they feed on creatures while the creatures are alive. Botfly and warblefly larvae, for example, feed inside living mammals. Some of these fly lay eggs right on the living animal, and when the larvae hatch, they bore into the skin to the eat the inside of the poor little animal. The animal might even help the larvae get inside its body by looking at the area where the larvae are, larvae are because it feels itchy. Other parasitic flies don't lay eggs on the flesh, but lay their tiny eggs inside 
other insects like mosquitoes, which then transmit the eggs into the animal with their bite. When the eggs enter the animal, they hatch. This is one way animals get worms. Fortunately, we can prevent such infections with proper medicines, which was why our pets should have a yearly checkup from a vet. Sticky feet. Flies can walk upside down on very smooth surfaces, even glass. They can do this for at least two reasons. First, a fly has tiny sharp claws at the bottom of each foot. These claws can grip the very tiny bumps and ridges that exist on any surface, even ones that feel smooth to you and me. Each foot has a wet sticky pad that can work like a suction cup to keep the fly attached to the surface. So if you want to, you can try this. If you want to watch a fly's mouth up close, you can catch a fly by rubbing a bit of banana on the inside of a glass jar and putting the jar outside or inside if you've got flies inside. When a fly visits, pop the lid on and look at the fly use its proboscis to sponge up the banana. Use a magnifying glass if you have one. Then observe how often it cleans itself. Watch the cleaning process. What, what does it do first? What part of its body does it clean? If you want the fly to live for long, be sure to have an adult poke holes in the jar lids. Next, we're going to look at mosquitoes nasty little creatures no one likes mosquitoes except of course other mosquitoes they land on warm-blooded animals unsheath their swords called stylets stab them into the skin and spit out anti-clotting saliva and begin drawing up blood as i mentioned in a previous lesson only the female mosquito feeds on blood the male eats nectar Unfortunately, female mosquitoes lay several hundred to a few thousand eggs in a lifetime. So there's always plenty of mosquitoes. Yay. Females cannot lay eggs until they have filled up on enough protein from blood. They, then they find a nice still pool of water like a bird bath or a puddle under a bush and lay their eggs. Mosquitoes can breed in almost any amount of standing water including water pooled in a discarded candy wrapper. The larvae move around near the surface of the water, getting air from air tubes that stick out of the water. They get their food from the water, typically eating algae and other tiny creatures. They can dive down into the water if disturbed, and they prefer to wiggle around near the surface, that, which is why some call them wigglers. The larvae generally enter the pupa stage within a few days or weeks of hatching depending on the water temperature and the species. The pupae are called tumblers because they tumble in the water when they are disturbed. Although tumblers do not eat, they do move around in the water quite a bit. And like the larvae, they get air from tubes that stick out of the water. The pupa stage lasts only a few days and then the mosquito becomes an adult. Interestingly enough, different species of mosquito prefer different kinds of blood. While some species prefer human blood, Others prefer the blood of cows or horses. Unfortunately, there are so many different species of mosquito that most mammals have at least one kind of mosquito that feeds on their blood. Yay. So how does a female mosquito find you so she can drink your blood? Well, she doesn't have good eyesight, but she can detect movement fairly well. If you are wearing brightly colored clothing or are moving around a lot, you're more likely to be noticed by a female mosquito. Mostly, however, she is drawn to the carbon dioxide that we breathe out of our mouths and the smell of certain chemicals that are present in our skin and sweat. The best way to get rid of the mosquitoes in your area is to get rid of any standing water, such as puddles or containers that are filled with water. If you have a bird bath, which is supposed to stay filled with water, replace the water every week. Getting rid of standing water will take away the breeding grounds for mosquitoes, which will reduce their population in your area. Crane flies have long been given the reputation of being mosquito eaters. Some people even call them mosquito hawks. This is just a myth. Crane fly larvae feed mostly on things that are rotting, and crane fly adults don't eat at all because they don't live very long. Mosquitoes can certainly be pets, but some also spread terrible diseases. 
Some mosquitoes in Africa, Asia, and Brazil transmit malaria, a potentially deadly disease. In South America and Africa, some mosquitoes transmit yellow fever, another potentially de deadly disease. Other mosquitoes can transmit the West Nile virus, which causes another life-threatening disease. This virus has been well known in Africa, East Europe, and West Asia, and the Middle East for many, many years. However, in 1999, a version of the virus appeared in the United States. Since then, it has been found in nearly every state. In 2004, there were 2,470 cases of the disease in the United States, and they resulted in 88 deaths. Avoiding mosquitoes, then, not only makes being outdoors more pleasant, it can help you stay healthy. Next, we're going to look at robber flies. As you already learned, many robber flies mimic bees and wasps so that predators will avoid them. Do you remember how robber flies got their name? They wait near a beehive and rob the hive of workers as they exit or return from foraging. Robber flies are skilled hunters and eat many insects besides bees. They can nab almost any insect flying through the air and usually prefer to grab insects much bigger than themselves. These little flies can even snatch a dragonfly they typically grab onto their prey with their bristled legs and then use a needle-like mouth part to inject saliva that contains a toxin that paralyzes the prey and chemicals that liquefy its insides. Then they proceed to suck, it up, suck up the resulting liquid. That is disgusting and very cruel. Robber flies are easy to identify if you know what you are looking for. Robber flies' eyes have seem to be raised above the head. This makes a gap in between the eyes. Many have a face that appears quite hairy, even with a beard below their eyes. Robber flies, and flies in general, tend to have smaller antennae than bees or wasps, though it is often hard to tell unless you're looking at them side by side. Wasps have smooth, shiny faces and no gap between their eyes. Bees have hairy-looking faces, but they generally don't appear as hairy as the robber fly's face. Bees can have hairy... Um, they also have no gap between their eyes. Based on these facts, can you identify each creature below as a robber fly, a bee, or a wasp? I know you guys can figure it out because you're smart. Next we're going to look at true bugs. Very few insects are actually bugs, but people still call them bugs. Does that bug you? Well, it's okay. I guess it's more of a nickname given to all creatures that crawl around or fly around bugging people. At the same time, so many nicknames of insects have the name bug in them. Ladybug, bed bug, lightning bug, pill bug, and none of these are bugs. In fact, pill bugs aren't even insects because they have more than six legs. Stink bugs, cinch bugs, and water bugs, however, are really bugs. So what makes a bug a bug? Well, all true bugs have sucking mouths that are equipped with needle-like parts which pierce into plants or other insects and suck out the juices. This, of course, is very similar to mosquitoes. <coughs> but unlike mosquitoes, true bugs don't feed on human blood. True bugs belong to order uh, he Hemiptera, Hemiptera, which means half wing. They get this name because their front pair of wings starts out thick and leathery near the thorax, but toward the tip they become thin and membranous. Usually they fold their wings partially over their backs, producing an X or a V pattern that you can see. One common true bug seen through the summer months is the stink bug. There are many different kinds of stink bugs. Most of them eat living plants and only bother humans with their horrible stink. This, as you know, is their defense. And it's a good one because birds and frogs and people just leave them alone. Water striders, the insects you see skimming the surface of ponds, streams, and puddles, are also true bugs. These incredible creatures actually walk on water. How do they do that? You will do an experiment in a moment to find out. As they skim along the surface of the water, they feed on living and dead insects that fall into the water, as well as small creatures that live in the water. They have great vision and can quickly move to an insect that has just fallen into the water. So try this. 
To see how a water strider can walk on water, get some scissors, a small sewing needle, a small square of tissue paper or a square of toilet paper, and a bowl of water. Cut out the paper so that it's about a quarter of one fourth or a quarter the size of the square of the toilet paper. Place the paper carefully on top of the water and quickly but gently rest the needle on the paper. The paper should sink. The needle should float. Keep trying this until it works for you. The paper sinks because it quickly absorbs water, making it heavier than water. Why does the needle float? Although it's made of steel and should sink, it is held up by the water's surface tension, which is like a thin skin on the surface of the water. If an object doesn't exert a lot of pressure on the surface of the water, this skin will hold it up, keeping it from sinking. If you look at back at the picture of the water stray, you can see his skin bending where the insect's legs touch it. Next is giant water bugs. The giant water bug is another kind of true bug. This strange and large creature can grow up to four inches long. It too sucks the juice out of its prey, which includes insects, tadpoles, and small fish. It grabs these unfortunate creatures with its pincher-like front legs, while it uses its other four legs for swimming. Although it spends most of its time in the water, it can fry, fly from place to place in search of better ponds with more food. Since it must have air, the giant water bug abdomen also has its own snorkel, which it sticks out of the water to breathe while it scans the water for prey. It sits motionless like a dead leaf, and when a prey passes by totally unaware of the giant water bug's presence, the bug darts out and snatches up the hapless creature. Sometimes a giant water bug will grab onto your toe with its front feet if you step on it. This feels like a bite, so some people call the giant water bug a toe biter. The bug isn't doing that because it wants food, however. It's just defending itself. So, don't forget to do your notebook activities. And that is the end of the chapter.